Hello everybody, Mr. Peoples here, and we're going to be talking about the Great Depression today. Um, we have two learning targets. I can describe how the economy changed after the collapse of the stock market in 1929, and I can compare President Hoover's and President Roosevelt's reaction to the Great Depression. All right, 1920s, there was this time of prosperity where people were very successful. Uh, businesses were making all kinds of things, and then because of that, people had jobs, and because people had jobs, they were getting paid more, and because they were getting paid more, um, they could go out and buy more things. And then that cycle would just continue uh, as long as the jobs and unemployment was low. In the 1920s, the stock market was a bull market, or a market with rising values. Uh, many people began to buy stocks in companies. Even people who never before would have afforded stocks now could. And then those people that could not afford stocks began to what was called buy on margin, or they would purchase stocks on credit. And what this basically was is that you would take a loan out from the bank, and using that loan, you would buy your stocks. And then if your stocks did really well, you would eventually pay back that loan to the bank. But not many people considered what might happen if that bull market with rising prices would turn into a bear market with falling prices. And in the summer of 1929, the stock prices hit their ultimate high. They hit their peak. And then prices start to drop just a little bit. And those people who had had loans and hadn't paid them off yet, they get scared. And so they quickly go and sell off their loans or sell their stocks in order to pay off their loans. And this makes people a little bit nervous and the market continues to slowly go lower and lower as more and more people start to sell their stocks and get out of the market. All right, now, in September of 1929, the total value of all the stocks was $87 billion. On Thursday, October 24th, a panic hit the stock market. Within three hours, the market lost $11 billion in value. Now, people were afraid about or scared about this, and so they go home for the weekend, hoping that on Monday things are going to rebound. But on Monday, the prices drop again. And so then on Tuesday, October 29th, if there was anybody that hadn't gotten out of the stock market yet, they all tried to get out on Tuesday. But what happens is that so many people want to sell their stocks, but not very many people wanted to buy them. And for that reason, the prices collapse. And it becomes known as Black Tuesday. Within one month, or excuse me, within two months, uh, by November of 1929, $30 billion in stock value had disappeared from the stock market. Now this has an effect on all businesses, and specifically banks. Because banks, not only were they giving loans to people to buy stocks, but the banks were also buying stocks themselves. And so there becomes, after the crash, there's this bike banking crisis that causes a lot of people to lose their money. Banks who were in the stock market lose their investments, and customers who had borrowed money from the banks are unable to pay back the bank loans. And so because of that, some of these banks went out of business, and people who had put all of their savings into these banks lost everything. Imagine that, working for 40 years of your life. You work for 40 years, and you, all that money that you raised for 40 years that you have in your savings account is now gone. You have zero money to your name. And that's what happened to a lot of people during this time. Um, and because people had heard about this and they didn't want to lose their money, people start to run to the bank to try and get all their money out of the bank. They were afraid their bank might close and leave them with zero savings. So they rushed to the banks to take out their money. But here's the problem. If you got to the bank first, you were generally able to get your money with the cash that the bank had on hand. But if you were the last one to get to the bank and the banks were no longer didn't have any more cash or didn't have any more money, 
then you didn't get any of your savings. It was all gone, and the bank would go out of business. And by 1931 alone, 2,200 banks closed. If you take a look at this picture, uh, this is a group of people who are trying to make a run on a bank. They're trying to get to a bank to get their money out before it closes. Uh, now, this also has an effect on business because businesses had their monies in the bank as well. And so when banks go under, businesses lose all of their savings. And because of that, some businesses are forced to close. Other businesses, because people are not doing as well, they don't have as, their jobs, the businesses aren't, people aren't buying as much stuff. Um, so businesses are forced to cut back on production and that causes people to lose their jobs. Unemployment soars to more than four million workers unemployed during this first few years of the Depression. Now, President Hoover, the president at the time, he did not believe it was the government's job to provide direct relief. So if you want to think of it this way, he didn't think that it was the government should give money to regular citizens. Okay, Thought that that was wrong. Um, but he did help out businesses. He thought the government's role was to help out businesses. So he loaned banks $1.2 billion to try and keep them from going out of business. He helped businesses, but he resisted giving direct money to people. Americans were very unhappy, and they looked at this as if the president didn't care for them. And they were very angry at the lack of the government response. Matter of fact, they started making fun of President Hoover. Um, by naming things uh, that indicated that you were poor um, after Hoover. For example, uh, a group of tin shacks and cardboard shacks that were built when people lost their homes and their jobs, uh, these little uh, settlements would pop up in cities and they became known as Hoovervilles. And they're just tin and cardboard shacks that uh, people would live in for shelter until uh, they could get back on their feet again. Um, one of the biggest examples of Hoover making the citizens of the United States angry involves the Bonus Army. A bonus, the Bonus Army was a group of World War I veterans who were promised a bonus in 1941. But many of these men had lost their jobs and were now unemployed and had said, we don't want that money in 1941, we need that money now. Uh, we want our bonus, our military bonus that we've earned, we want it now. Um, Hoover and Congress did not want to give them their money at that point because of the depression and, and it would bankrupt the, the, the economy. And so uh, the bonus army marches on Washington. They actually set up a Hooverville just outside of Washington, D.C. And President Hoover decided to use the military to scatter these veterans and remove them from their Hooverville. Uh, this is a problem in that the military uses force and they burn one of the Hoovervilles, which results in a couple of deaths, uh, one of which was a, a young child. And this is all over the newspaper, it's all over the newsreels, and the public was outraged at Hoover's reaction to this bonus army. We'll look, we'll look a little bit more or find out some more information about that in class when we talk a little bit more about the Bonus Army. Now, in 1932, there's, uh, Hoover is up for re-election, and he's up against a new uh, a Democratic candidate by the name of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, now, Herbert Hoover was the Republican nominee. Uh, there weren't a lot of people who thought he could win because of the situation that the United States was in at the time. Uh, but his strategy was that he warned that the, the, the democratic programs would weaken uh, America's spirit of, of working. Uh, meanwhile, Franklin Roosevelt, the democratic nominee, uh, was the governor of New York at the time, and he had already taken steps in New York to provide help to the people in New York. He had this air of confidence and optimism about him that appealed to the voters of the time, and he wins the 1932 election in a landslide. Here you can see the two candidates, Herbert Hoover, the Republican, and Delano Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, the Democrat. Okay? Um, Roosevelt ends up winning that election. <clears throat> 
as the new president, he takes office in March of 1933, and he, he says to the American people that recovery is possible. One of his famous quotes from his inaugural address was, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, and he promised that the government would help. And so Roosevelt calls a special session of Congress that became known as the 100 Days. And the President and Congress work together to create new programs to battle the Depression and aid economic recovery. These programs become known as the New Deal. Um, part of that was trying to restore confidence in American banks. So Roosevelt ordered all banks to close temporarily. Uh, the Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed, and the government inspected the finances of a bank before it was allowed to reopen. Then Roosevelt goes on the radio in his first fireside chat, as he called them, um, to address the American people about the safety of putting your money in the banks. And he did, number of these, he did a number of these fireside chats. Um, he spoke directly to the American people, and uh, about virtually everything that was going on in the country, he would, give, he would speak to the American people through radio. And the first order of business was getting people to put their money back into the banks. And uh, his fireside chat provided some of that confidence. And then Congress and the president create these programs th that were all geared to trying to employ people or put people to work building things or making things or farming things. And so these are just some of them. Uh, the two that are probably most well known, the Civil Works Administration, employed 4 million Americans to build roads and airports. The Civilian Conservation Corps was big here in Minnesota. It provided jobs to thousands building trails and planting forests. Basically, from 18 years old to 30 year old, you could be in the Civilian Conservation Corps. You got paid uh, $25, or excuse me, you got paid $30, and $25 was required to be sent back to your family. And then the other $5 was yours to keep. Um, you would live on these camps, in, like in northern Minnesota, and you would build the roads in northern Minnesota. You would plant trees, uh, hang telephone wire, things like that. And then some of the others that you can see here, uh, you can read about if you would like to. Uh, all of these are part of what became known as the New Deal. Now, some people thought the New Deal went too far. They, they criticized the government that the government was becoming too strong and too powerful and that, too much, that the government was too much in control of what we were doing. Uh, business leaders were concerned about the higher taxes that all of these programs um, created. And then on the other side of things, you had senators and uh, people of America who thought that the New Deal didn't go far enough. They thought that the, the president needed to do more to help these uh, people that were struggling at the time. Well, in 1934, there was a congressional election, and America showed support of Roosevelt by uh, electing Democrats into office. And so Roosevelt saw this as an approval of what he was doing, and he created more New Deal programs. Uh, and these laws became known as the Second New Deal. Now, Roosevelt was in a wheelchair, and we're going to talk more about Roosevelt in the wheelchair um, in class. But his eyes and ears were, uh, were his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt's eyes and ears. Uh, his wife would travel the country and talk to people that were in these programs, people that were affected by these programs, and come back to her husband and tell him whether they were working well or whether they weren't working well, and things that needed to be changed, things that needed to be fixed. Uh, she would let him know about those things. And so Eleanor Roosevelt ends up being his uh, eyes and ears as he is in a wheelchair and is pretty much uh, stuck within Washington uh, and the surrounding areas. Uh, she actually goes out and travels the country uh, speaking for him and, uh, and looking at things for him.